One Piece is on the cover of the magazine this week, featuring the Monster Trio. For all you new One Piece fans watching, the Monster Trio is One Piece's most iconic trio. They are Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji. They are the core of the Straw Hat Pirates when it comes to fighting and are incredibly powerful and reliable in their own ways. If Luffy is the king of the pirates, you could say that Zoro and Sanji are the wings of the pirate. The title of One Piece manga chapter 1111 is The Sun's Shield. The cover page of the chapter is a cover requested by Hiyu. Luffy and his crew are seen using glowing jellyfish as parasols. They are on a deep sea stroll while eating some french fries. And accompanying them are Dr. Vegapunk, Kuma, and Bonnie, who is in a real child appearance. This color spread was beautifully drawn by Oda. Although, I was expecting the cover page to be a tribute to Toriyama Sensei, who sadly passed away recently. Perhaps there wasn't enough time, but Oda Sensei did have a little one in his author's comment. He believes that Toriyama Sensei is as carefree as ever, building models with a halo above him, and that the life of a mangaka is tough and he salutes him. The chapter begins with a looming threat at the Labo phase. Back in chapter 1110, we saw St. Mars ascending to the top of the Labo phase and attacking the barrier. His attacks continue in this chapter, but this time with greater intent. St. Mars uses his hockey to destroy the barrier. Shortly after the barrier breaks, St. Mars enters the Labo phase. With the powerful hockey emanating from St. Mars, Jinbei notices it and says that his hockey is unreal. Jinbei rushes towards Zoro. He tells Zoro that the fight is over and that they must move immediately. Zoro is panting and trying to catch his breath. He tells Jinbei that he is not leaving as he sees Rob Lucci still standing. Rob Lucci is in a bloodied mess. His chest is covered by the slash marks from Zoro's new technique. Lucci is unable to move. However, despite being defeated, Lucci refuses to go down. After being defeated by Luffy and Zoro in a single arc, we gotta give it to Lucci for his willpower here. Lucci laughs softly, and then lets out a strong yell. <laughs> Sanji asks Jinbei if he has gotten Zoro. Jinbei replies that he is on it, as he's trying to hold Zoro back. It seems like Zoro wants to deliver another blow to Lucci, but Jinbei reminds him again that he has already won, but Zoro is unhappy. This dude literally defeated Lucci, and he still wants to finish him off. Zoro is just brutal. Jinbei glances to his side and notices that Lucci turned towards their direction. Jinbei apologizes to Lucci for what he is about to do. Immediately after, Jinbei unleashes an attack with a new technique called Fishman Karate 5000 Brick Fist to blow Lucci away. But Lucci stood his ground. Jinbei takes Zoro with him to meet up with the rest of the crew. A moment later, Lucci begins to turn back to his human form and hears the sound of wings flapping. Saint Mars in his yokai form descends towards Lucci. Saint Mars calls out to Lucci and asks where York is. Lucci gets on his knees. He is absolutely shocked and horrified. Meanwhile, Zoro looks back and sees Saint Mars. He is taken aback and asks Jinbei what that actually is. But Jinbei is more focused on hurrying away and getting to the rendezvous point as soon as they can. Back to Lucci. He tells Saint Mars that York is on the fourth floor of Building A. For those of you who may not remember, at the end of chapter 1089, we saw York in chains captured by Luffy and his crew, and since then, she is still tied up in the same control room. Lucci reports to Saint Mars about everything he knows about the Straw Hats and their plans. He tells Saint Mars that the two pirates that ran off are Zoro and Jinbei. In the Labo phase, there are five more Straw Hats and two Vegapunks. Lucci catches his breath and adds that the Straw Hat Pirates are planning to escape from the back entrance of the Labo Stratum. Lucci further adds that 85 Cypher Pole agents and 4 Seraphim are imprisoned in the basement. Lucci concludes his report by telling St. Mars that there are 6 more minutes remaining before Vegapunk's message is broadcasted to the world. St. Mars compliments Lucci and tells him that he has no more questions for him. Hattori arrives at the scene as well. As St. Mars begins to ascend in the air, Lucci tells St. Mars that there is one more thing he would like to say. 
Luchi tells St. Mars that his fellow CP0 partner, Kaku, is in the control room as well. He was badly injured when he had left him. Luchi requests from St. Mars to find a way to spare Kaku. Unfortunately for Luchi, St. Mars tells him that it might not be possible at all. As St. Mars flies into the air, he tells Luchi that it is hard to single out a single insect when you're exterminating the hive. Man, this is cold! And I think this all but confirms how the Gorosai see humans as a whole. And it does not matter if they are allies or not. We've seen St. Saturn label humans as insects several times now across different chapters. And now, we see St. Mars using the same term, insects, as well. They really believe that they are truly above everyone. The scene shifts to the center of Egghead Island. Luffy is overjoyed as he realizes that it's really the giants that he is seeing from Little Garden. Dory and Broggy are overjoyed to see Luffy as well. Broggy is holding Luffy in the palm of his hand, and between them lies St. Jew Peter's corpse. Dory says that it's been over two years, and they could hardly recognize Luffy now. Broggy laughs and tells Luffy that in Elbaf, they tell tales about sun god Nika. Broggy then asks Luffy where he had learned about how Nika looked. Luffy is puzzled, which isn't surprising at all since Luffy doesn't know about sun god Nika. We saw that back in chapter 1107, Bonnie found out that Luffy was Nika and told him that she had been looking for him the whole time. And Luffy asks Bonnie what Nika was. And now, Dory and Broggy have briefly brought it up again. Broggy tells Luffy that it was a pleasant surprise when they found out that Luffy is the sun god. Luffy tells them that he doesn't understand what they are talking about, and adds that they can talk about it later. Warcury notices Dory and Broggy, and Saturn says that this further adds to the complexity of the situation. Dory feels like they are back in the jungles of Elbaf after seeing Warcury and Saturn in their beast forms. Luffy tells Dory and Broggy that they're not supposed to fight right now, and that their main priority is to run away. Dory tells Luffy that they are aware of that as they had bumped into Sanji earlier. A short flashback is shown. Sanji was carrying Vegapunk's body. Sanji tells Dory and Broggy that when they see Luffy, they are to tell him to meet on the other side of the island. Sanji tells them that he is counting on them. Dory and Broggy affirms the request and tells Sanji that they will bring Luffy there. The scene shifts where we can see an overview of Egghead Island and the location of the different groups. In the overview, all the characters are in chibi mode. On the coast of Egghead Island, we see all the marine ships surrounding Egghead Island. In the center of the island, we see Luffy's group, where Luffy is with Dory and Broggy. Up in the Labo phase, we see Nami and Usopp's group. Based on the previous chapters, Edison and Chopper, Lilith and Brooke are also in the group. Sanji and Vegapunk are just behind Bonnie's group. Bonnie's group is the closest to the rendezvous point. It is the back entrance of the Labo Stratum, where the giant warrior's pirate ship is located. In Bonnie's group are Frankie, Kuma, Atlas, one of the giants, and Bonnie. The scene shifts back to the center of Egghead Island. Broggy tells Luffy that after seeing the news, they decided to help him escape. He also tells Luffy that the reports had said the Navy was surrounding his crew and him. Dory starts to blow his Jaller horn. The sound reverberates around Egghead Island. Several giants in various places of the island hear the sound. At the coast of Egghead Island, some of the giants lift their swords up in the air. One of the giants says that the sound is the signal from the captains. Now that their captains have found Luffy, they can all head back to the ship and get out of the island. Another giant remarks that the marine warships do not have any treasure to loot, so it's pointless to stick around. After hearing the sound, Warkery noticed that it was the signal for retreat. In his eyes, retreating after causing such a commotion is unacceptable. He tells Dory, Broggy, and Luffy that he is going to blow a horn of his own. With this horn, he will drive home the point that escape is futile. And then, Warcury lets out a war cry. Saw what I did there? <laughs> the roar is so powerful that Dory and Broggy have to use their shields to cushion the impact of the roar. 
The roar reverberates throughout the island as buildings begin to shake like an earthquake just happened. Because Luffy did not have a shield, he receives the roar with full impact in the most hilarious way. The roar is so powerful that Luffy's eyes, hat, sandals, clothes except for his pants, and even his chest scar are all blown away from his body. Baragi is shocked as he sees what is happening to Luffy. He can't believe what he is seeing in front of him. Mercury's Conqueror's Hockey reaches even past the coast of Egghead Island, where the marine battleships are. One of the marines says that the island is going crazy again. And due to the sheer power of Mercury's Hockey, several marines begin to foam in their mouth and lose consciousness. The scene shifts back to Dory, Bragi, and Luffy. Bragi asks Luffy if he is okay. Dory is amazed that Luffy took the roar and held on. Dory laughs at how funky Luffy's body is. What happens next is just as hilarious as the earlier scene. Luffy says that was a close one, as he sticks his scar back to his chest like a sticker. <laughs> Come on, Luffy! This is Shonen! You gotta be more serious when you're fighting! I'm joking, guys. We all know that the more Luffy laughs and the goofier he gets, he gets more powerful. A moment later, Mercury turns two of his fangs into blades as the blades draw closer towards Luffy. Luffy is surprised. Dory calls Bragi by his name. Given the chemistry between these two giants, Bragi knows exactly what Dory wants to do. And in that moment, Dory and Bragi use a move called Savalin, also known as the Sun Shield to block Mercury's attack. We all know that Elbaf is heavily inspired by Norse mythology, and this move by Dory and Bragi is no different. Savalin is a legendary shield in Norse mythology. It stands in front of the sun, protecting the world from her heat. Dory and Bragi briefly stop Warkuri. Warkuri wonders what is the destiny that ties these giants to Luffy. Warkuri asks Dory and Bragi if they have any idea who Luffy is. Dory and Bragi laughs and tells Warkuri that Luffy is their friend. Immediately after, Dory and Bragi attacks Warkuri with another move called Split Skylda. The attack pushes Warkuri back and he crashes to the ground. Saturn is furious. He takes a deep breath and prepares for an attack. Now that he knows that Dory and Bragi are Luffy's friends, the Gorosei will have to erase them both from world history together with Luffy. Saturn then begins to spit out balls at Dory and Bragi. These balls are similar to the attack of Magellan, the former warden of Impel Down. Luffy tells Dory and Bragi that the balls are venomous and they should watch out. In the next moment, Luffy stretches his arm and reaches for a tree nearby. Luffy pulls the tree out and begins sculpting the tree. He sculpts the tree into a baseball bat and quickly paints it black with the number 56. Luffy laughs at his creation. Luffy then conjures up a baseball helmet and prepares for a swing. He is now Shohei Otani D. Luffy. <laughs> As the venomous balls draw closer, Otani D. Luffy makes a giant swing at it. He hits it back at the Gorosei's direction and laughs hysterically. <laughs> Otani D. Luffy tells the Gorosei to have a taste of his own medicine. Mercury and Saturn see the venomous ball approaching them, but they were too slow to react. The venomous balls hit both of them and it causes a huge explosion. Luffy's eyes pop out as he is shocked that the venomous balls caused the huge explosion. One of the giants nearby reports that the flames will block off the forest. Dory says that they will be leaving now. Bragi is laughing and says that the beasts are gone so it should not matter. Luffy is no longer laughing. He tells Bragi that they have to hurry while the Gorosei is down. He tells both the giants that the Gorosei can't die. In that moment, as Luffy said that, Jupiter, Mercury, and Saturn begin to regenerate again. The giants are shocked in disbelief. Dory questions if they are really immortal. Luffy has no idea. He tells Dory that no matter what he did, they kept on coming back. Bragi adds that he has never heard of any race or ability giving the power of immortality. As Dory, Bragi, and Luffy continue to run, Bragi still counts the battle between them and the Gorosei as a victory. 
The scene briefly shifts to the Labo phase. Nami tells Jinbei and Zoro to hurry. Jinbei tells Nami that they are on the way. Usopp is seen at the back having a conversation at the back with Brooke, Lilith, and Chopper. The scene shifts to Bonnie's group. They are approaching the ship and Bonnie sees a few people in front of them. As we have seen in Chapter 1106, Bonnie now sits at the very top of the command hierarchy of the Pacifista. In Chapter 1108, Vice Admiral Doberman declared that all Vice Admirals who were available to leave their station to eliminate Bonnie. And in Chapter 1109, one of the Marines reported to Vice Admiral Doberman that Bonnie was headed to the northeast shore. As Bonnie's group gets closer, they realize it's the Vice Admirals of the Marines. Standing there are Vice Admiral Pomsky, Guillotine, and Red King waiting for Bonnie to eliminate her. The scene shifts to Sanji running towards the ship while carrying Vegapunk's body. Meanwhile, St. Mars reaches the control room where York is. York is frightened and yells that it's a monster. St. Mars asks York where the room that was displayed in the broadcast is. And instead of telling St. Mars the location, York asks who he is and to leave her alone. The scene shifts to the marine ship where Kizaru had landed. One of the marines tells Kizaru to let them treat him if he is hurt. Kizaru tells them that his wounds run deep and that they should just let him rest. <coughs> Despite that, the marines still insist on treating his injuries. What these marines probably don't know is that Kizaru isn't just hurt physically. He had a mission to eliminate his friend, which definitely hurt him emotionally and mentally too. The scene shifts to the northwest coast of Egghead Island. Some of the marines are stunned by what they are seeing. One of them says that something way bigger than a giant just showed up. Another says that the flames aren't even affecting it. A loud creak and thud sounds are being heard as the robot from the scrapyard begins moving. It is finally alive! A marine reports that the thing that is moving is like a titan in the middle of an inferno. And it seems to be growling something. The robot finally speaks as it utters the words... Joy Boy, forgive me. And the chapter ends. What do you think the apology for Joy Boy is for? I'm curious to hear what you guys think. Let's continue this discussion in the comment section down below. Press like if you enjoyed the video, and if you don't want to miss out on future One Piece chapters like this one, definitely subscribe and hit that bell icon. There will be a break for the next three weeks. So, I will be creating videos from chapter 1095 to 1098. See you in the next video, and thank you!